Okay, so welcome back to SPED 780. In this video, we're going to take a look at developing transition goals. After we've conducted the assessment, really want to get into goal planning. And I think a good way to approach this is goal planning with families. So really transitioning them during the IEP process, you know, in K-12, typically parents don't have a lot of um, a big role in goal planning. So designing those goals for academic areas, uh, social, behavioral, whatever those are. So really, we want to transition them from a passive participant to an active participant when we go through the transition process. And this is really important for some of those points I made in the earlier video where parents are really going from a setting K-12 where they have a lot of support. <clears throat> when they get out of high school, there's very little to no support from special education personnel. And so they, we really want to foster and enable them to be an active participant in their student's transition process and really gain some um, understanding of what that looks like, gain some knowledge on how to help their child be as independent as possible. Um, the other thing we want to do is really help students um, kind of approach this through three ways. I like looking at Covey's principles of personal vision because that's what we really want the student and the parent to do is kind of develop a personal vision of what the student's life is going to look like out of high school. So we do this in three ways. There's three things we look at. Developing positive values. Okay, so here we're looking at developing independent life skills. Okay, this is something you know we're probably going to be working on from middle school all the way up to graduation, right, within the IEP. Developing positive work habits. This is something we can even work on if you're an elementary teacher having a focus on positive work habits for students, whether it's completing homework, turning homework in on time, having positive work habits in the classroom. Those are really important life skills um, that students are going to need when they get out of high school. Also creating meaningful and realistic expectations. Okay, This is kind of a challenge sometimes, especially if we have families that maybe don't quite see their child's um, skill level the same way that we do as educators. Or they may have unrealistic expectations for what that student's going to be able to do when they get out of when they get out of school. Okay. So really helping students to develop a really good understanding of their disability and really meaningful and realistic expectations of what that means for them um, during the course of their life. The second principle of personal vision is taking responsibility. So really helping students avoid those habits of learned helplessness. Now this is a common thing, right, when we're talking about students with special needs. Um, we have this in our own house. Josie, Josie has had, she has some learned helplessness um, that we are really trying to work through and creating some independence and relying on herself a little bit more for things, but it's hard. It's really hard for a kiddo who's used to having a para around and helping them all the time. Um, this year we had a change in Paris, um, kind of short notice, right after Christmas break, and it kind of threw us off guard, um, made me a little nervous, you know, as it can for any parent that we're going to have some change. Is that change going to be good or is that change going to be bad? Well, Josie had had the same para for, gosh, two and a half years. She was really reliant on that para. They had developed more of a, um, and I think this is pretty natural, you know, the para cared a lot about her, and it was more of a parenting type um, environment. And really, for Josie, that wasn't necessarily good for her independence. And so now she's with a new para that really sees her more as a second grader and has expectations for her as a second grader and really is starting to foster some independence. Now, Josie has some pushback on that because she wants someone to help her all the time. But it's really good for her. And it was interesting. I had a conversation with another teacher at Josie's building um, who teaches in their more self-contained environment. She was saying she had been to a training recently, and I was talking about changing a student's para every single year so they don't get used to that consistency. Because, man, it's hard not to um, help that student get that learned helplessness. Okay, even as parents we do it. I know we've done it with Josie on some things. For example, putting her shoes on. She's nine years old. She knows how to put her shoes on. She has some learned helplessness on that. She'll still bring them to me and ask me to put them on for her. And 
Sometimes, out of convenience, I do, because it's a lot faster. But really, I'm contributing to the learned helplessness. I really need to push her to be more independent. So that taking responsibility is so important. And I think that's a really important concept. If Even in your, if you're in this class and you teach elementary age um, students, really still focusing on that, taking responsibility at that young age and pushing them as much as you can to take responsibility because that's better for them in the long run. You know, and that's what our focus has to be. Um, it's really better for them to avoid that learned helplessness because, man, when they get out of school and they don't have that parent with them every day, or, you know, they don't have a job coach with them every day, and they've got to do it, you know, and do it well. Um, that's where some of those challenging days where we were pushing them to be independent will be all worth it. And then cultivating a circle of influence. Man, this is so important, too. And I think this is something, because we have so much that we're focusing on in, in special education, something we don't always think about with transition planning. We don't always think about... Um, as we're working with students, but really developing that community involvement, um, getting good role models for students, really helping them when they get out of school that they have this environment around them that's a positive influence, that they're plugged in and engaged in doing things um, within their community. Now, where we live, we live in a suburban area of a large city, so there's lots of opportunities for community involvement here. Um, in Kansas City. There are things like Inclusion Connection um, that high school students do, and they have all kinds of activities they do with students with disabilities. Uh, the other night they had a bowling night where the kids all get together and socialize and go bowling. They have a uh, business that they have started that some of the students um, work in where they've developed dog treats and different um, dog uh, accessories that you can buy and they sell them at the local farmers markets. Um, you know, so if you live in a city in a suburban environment, that community involvement, um, there's a lot more opportunity, okay? But there are opportunities in small towns, too. For example, my brother, he is really involved in sports, and um, he lives just a block away from the university at Pitt State, and he goes to all the sporting events. Uh, the athletes know him. That's how he's involved in the community. He also, um, even though he has uh, mild cerebral palsy, he started running about six years ago. And so he's kind of gotten involved in the 5K community. And he runs races. And he, when he goes to a race, he knows people. Those are all good things for his quality of life. So that circle of influence is really important. And that's something we can help cultivate when we're working with students, especially in those middle school, high school years, helping them find some things they can get plugged into outside of the school day, whether it's Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, church activities, maybe a sport that they like, Special Olympics, any of those things. Those are really helpful. And if we combine all of these things, it really helps us kind of drive a vision of the future, of what we want this child's life to look like out of high school, and then develop some goals related to that. So here is kind of an example vision statement if we think about um, walking through um, what the students like, what they want it to look like, okay? And then this helps us write some goals and develop some goals. So this is an example of a textbook. It says, after graduation, I would like to work with children and spend my evenings living with a friend or a spouse in a place of my own. On weekends, I hope to spend time with my family, attend church, and pursue my interests in photography. So this is the student's vision statement. They've developed this with uh, input from their teachers, input from their case manager, and their parents and family. Okay? There are lots of different goals that we can write just based on this vision statement, whether it's the goal of working with children. Okay, so what does that look like? What kind of skills do we need to be able to do that? Uh, even something like spending time with my family, attending church. There we get into that circle of influence. How do we develop that now? So when they're independent and they're out of K-12, they're able to do those things. Um, living with a friend or a spouse in a place of my own. There's lots of different life skills, right, that we need to be able to live independently. Also a different set of skills to be able to live with a roommate. So what does that look like? What kind of goals do we need to have in place to be able to get along with a roommate and live with a roommate uh, cohesively? 
So IDA approved goals have to have two things. They have to have a timeline and they have, a, have to have a description of what they will be doing specifically for three areas, employment, independent living, or post-secondary education. So typically the timeline is upon completion of high school or after completion of high school. And then we would say John will work at or John will live at or John will enroll in. Okay, That kind of covers those those three areas. So when you're thinking about uh, developing those goals, you want to really keep these two things in mind. Timeline and then description of what they're going to be doing specifically related to employment, independent living, and post-secondary education. One of the links that you'll find within this module is a great resource on determining the need for independent living goals. Okay, So here the student either performs skills independently and consistently or they don't. Okay, they don't perform those skills. Or it's an area of, it's not an area of independence that's being considered at this time. So, for example, home living. We have a student that wants to live independently. We can ask ourselves these questions, ask the parents, the student these questions. Can they follow a daily living routine? Select clothes, get dressed, personal hygiene independently. Okay. Can they purchase, prepare, and store food and maintain a healthy diet? Um, can they perform light household maintenance? Appropriately make and receive telephone calls. Or follow disaster safety routines for fire and natural disaster. Okay, So that really helps us determine the need for some independent living post-secondary goals. So I know, for example, um, I'll, I'll give you a couple examples. Uh, for my brother, he moved out when he was... Oh gosh, maybe 25 into a duplex that's literally a block from my parents. Um, but he lived in their basement and had to really demonstrate some independent skills before they were ready for him to be able to do that, to kind of show him that. And, and it gets at some of these home living things. So he really had to show them that um, he could take care of himself, his personal hygiene. He would stay on top of it. He would dress appropriately. Um, he started taking care of his room, making sure it was clean, making sure his bathroom was clean, uh, demonstrating how to do that. Um, his difficult thing is he gets flustered if something goes wrong. So, for example, he had a plumbing problem in his basement recently in his duplex. So how does he handle that? You know, does he call and get help initially, or does he try to combat the problem and possibly make it worse before he reaches out and gets help? So my parents really went through a process of training him on those things. Or if there's a fire in his microwave, what do you do? Those kinds of things, really walking him through that. He really needed help processing those emergency type situations and really having a very clear idea in his head of what he was supposed to do. Okay. So for example, with Josie, some of the uh, post-secondary goals that we will eventually have for her is since she um, signs primarily for her language, she needs to know how to use um, VOP services to be able to call the doctor and speak through an interpreter and ask questions, or call the pharmacy and speak through an interpreter and ask questions, or even calling 911 okay, and using an interpreter to um, communicate for her. Those are really important skills. We're already working on using an interpreter um, in situations like when she goes to a doctor's appointment. She's done that for a couple of years, and she's getting pretty good at that, really, using that interpreter to communicate to the doctor for her. But she needs to know how to do it on a phone uh, before she was going to live independently. For Josie, she is tube-fed, and so right now, all of her nutrition comes from us. Okay, So if she's hungry, she is reliant on us to do the tube feeding. Unlike my son Hank, who's in first grade, if he's hungry, he knows he can get in the pantry, get some crackers out, open them up, and eat them, right? He can do that independently already um, at seven. Josie is is totally uh, dependent on us to feed her. So one of the things we will start working on as she gets a little bit older and is able to do it is doing the tube feedings herself and really being able to independently manage uh, her diet, okay? It's too soon for her to do that now, but that's definitely something that's been in our minds of a goal that we know she needs to get to, possibly by middle school, so that she can do that herself. Also contributes to her being more independent and not having that learned helplessness. 
you know, because now if she's hungry, she just kind of, um, you know, she sits there and she waits for us to feed her. She doesn't necessarily even communicate to us yet um, that she's feeling hungry. So. so take a look at this. This is a good tool to use to help you develop uh, post-secondary goals. So here's an example goal. Following graduation from high school, George will work part-time in a sheltered employment where he will receive on-the-job training to develop specific skills necessary to complete the work tasks of the sheltered employment. So this gives us an employment goal, but it also gives us that training goal for that on-the-job training. Okay. Here's another one. This is a little bit more lengthy. Okay, this covers a lot of different areas. Following graduation from high school, George will be employed four to six hours a day in a supported or sheltered employment in a site in his community and will receive daily on-the-job training to develop skills to complete their work tasks, as well as training in social, personal hygiene, and communication skills necessary for the workplace. George will use the public transit system to get to work and other community resources for his transportation needs. So this goal covers training right for employment, but also for those independent living skills because it plugs in personal hygiene, communication, social skills. Also independent living skills in terms of using public transportation. So that's a pretty detailed goal. But man, if, if I had George move into my classroom and he was in, and he was a junior in high school and I read this goal, I would clearly know what I needed to be working on with him, right? Because the goal is very specific. <clears throat> the other thing that we need to consider as we do transition planning is transition services. And a recent textbook I was looking at on transition um, had this great table that really laid out transition services from the age of 14 when we start transition planning all the way to 18, 19 plus. And I thought this was really helpful because it kind of gives us a scale of what those services look like, how they're a little bit more um, all-encompassing at that 14 to 15 range, and they get pretty specific when we get to 18 to 19. So I just want to pick a few of these out and look at them, okay? Because it does kind of give us some ideas of things we need to be doing if we teach middle school versus teaching high school. So community experience. This starts pretty early. So if you look at 14 to 15, we're doing job shadowing, and we're, this student wants to work in a clerical position. So he's already at 14, 15 visiting those types of work environments. Okay, 16 to 17 range, he's doing some informational interviews with employers. And then look, 18 to 19, he's working four days a week, getting that experience. Okay, so all the way at 14, we're starting to, to experience that job and see if that's something that's a good fit for him. I know sometimes uh, when we look at job experiences, it's a challenge because sometimes we um, kind of have to put students in boxes based on the opportunities that we have available to the school for job shadowing. We ran into this with Phil. This is one of the things I know that my parents really fought for um, his senior year of high school because the school that he went to, they typically have students rotate through different jobs. It was the same job sites uh, each year. He had done those job sites his junior year. Two of those job sites he didn't do real well at. But one of them he loved, and that was working in the electronics department at Walmart. And so as they did his planning for his senior year, my parents really wanted him to spend that entire year getting job training at Walmart in the electronics department since that was his strength and really working on that. So that way when he got out of school, it could possibly turn into a job. And I will say there was some pushback from the IEP team because that didn't really fit what they'd done traditionally in the past with kids um, on job sites. But they went ahead and agreed and Phil did that for a year. And when he graduated, he got a job at Walmart and he's worked there for 17 years now. So that was a, that was a really good change that the teachers made and what they typically have done in the past to give Phil that really good year of experience with some job shadowing, some on-job coaching that turned into a career for him. I mean, he just loves it. It's just, he loves to go to work. It's a great fit for him. If he hadn't found that, um, you know, I don't know what he would be doing. I would hate to see him in a job he doesn't like um, or not having jobs. I think it's really important for him to have purpose, and he has purpose um, in his life through that job. So um, let's take a look at daily living skills. If we look at that 14 to 15 range, 
Uh, we work on social skills training, also work on some health and safety. When we get to 16 and 17, some kids start venturing out doing some things independently. So we look at travel training, look at how to handle emergencies. Um, and then at 18 to 19, we really start working on budgeting and managing money and managing purchases, those kinds of things. So this is a good resource to look at when you're thinking about just the scope and sequence of transition services and, and what that looks like. I think it also uh, helps me, even if I'm working with students that are in the transition process, to see what my students need to be able to do and what they're going to be exposed to later on. So, because, um, you know, you play a really important role in the building blocks of getting here, even if you're working with first and second graders. <clears throat> so that really wraps up the transition uh, instructional piece. I really encourage you to look at the resources that are available uh, within the module, and especially take a look at those age-appropriate transition assessments. There's a whole range of assessments there that you can use with students and with parents. Um, and I really encourage you, don't reinvent the wheel on those assessments. Use things that are already provided. <clears throat>